So, for what you're about to receive, I hope you're not offended, because the subtitle of my talk tonight is a personal view, and it's going to be deeply personal. So I'm not offending anybody, I'm talking about <clears throat> what I know and how I came about this. I was born in a, in a constipated town a uh, Dutch reformed constipated town called Robertson in 1950, an auspicious year, um, and was thrust into being grounded by this extremely crazy woman called Maria Klunk, who raised me. She was as mad as a hatter. Um, at that tender age, dragged me to a chopping block and beheaded chickens in, in, in fountains of blood. I have no idea how I survived the woman, but <clears throat> she was of the earth and from the earth. She knew how to make compost. She, she was an extraordinary influence on my life. But perhaps even a greater influence was my grandfather, Opa Boy, here on a Saturday morning with a hat and an honor bike and, and, and braces neatly dressed, you can see his shoes are buffed, um, and every Saturday morning he would put me in a wheelbarrow because our family and his family didn't have cars, um, in an old Hessian sack uh, with a bottle of cold coffee, and he would wheel me out of town into the felt, as it was known. <clears throat> we would stop and kick um, fungi, you know, the wonderful khaki-colored fungi under eucalypts called Bobbyan snuff. And, you know, after being showered in Bobbyan snuff, we would wheel into the felt and with meticulous care and enormous love and devotion, he showed me um, the, the hidden connections of where to find edible tubers like uh, Kamakua and Kambrua and how to eat Num Num. He was an extraordinary influence on my life. I went to school and became the fattest boy, um, deeply bullied, um, and I took revenge on these bastards by going to the library to Tony Bessie de Clark and said, may I join? And she said, yes, you may. And I got a little yellow card and I start, I'll never forget it, I started at the door left and read the entire library. I didn't understand a bloody word about Guy de Maupassant, and I remember reading Credo Mutua, but I thought that knowledge would buffer me against bullies. And to this day, it seemed to have worked. You know, whenever I'm in a corner, I sort of sotto voce say, do you know there are 926 camels in Beirut kind of thing. And then I became thin um, uh, after puberty uh, because I realized that the world was complex and I didn't understand it at all. From there, I joined the forestry department and became a forester. This was conceivably one of the greatest mistakes of my life um, because it's, it, it, I, I, there I am and with that strange little cap. Um, it's infinitely boring planting trees, watching them for 35 years and then uh, chopping them down and planting them again. Um, but what I learned from, from making this mistake is that if you wish to make mistakes, make huge mistakes. Uh, nothing bores me more than a litany of tiny mistakes. If you want to make a mistake, make a huge grand cock up and learn from it. I then, through a, an interview of, of flagrant lies, <coughs> managed to land a job at the university as a research assistant. Um, and some of you might remember Peter Novelli here in the top right hand corner. Pete and I were colleagues. And at that stage, Professor Rudolf Bigalki, who was head of the department, was interested in pheromone research. And here, this, by the way, this born to book is deeply anesthetized. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be standing there. But we looked at their pre orbital and interdigital 
communication and never found anything actually. Um, again, uh, talking about being stupid, in my mouth is a dart filled with M99, of which a nanogram would knock out a rhino. God, I was reckless. Um, but be that as it may, wonderful times. I then became a father um, in amongst all my other things, but um, during a, a conference in, at the University of Canterbury, there was a, a whole row of rather glum, oh God, I hope they know, are there any Spaniards in the room? But these were very sort of dull Spaniards called Jesus Maria Aranzabal and so on, and stared at me blandly while I was talking about hobby falcon hunting behavior and asked me whether I knew anything about lesser kestrels. And I said, yeah, well, in Wellington, the town near me, there are about 6,000 in a sleep in a tree every night, which had them in tears because that was the national population of Spain <laughs> sleeping in one tree. But it did get me hooked on possibly the most extraordinary um, journey of my life. I spent the next 15 years uh, traveling oh god all over the world <clears throat> in search of lesser kestrels because this was a time before miniaturized um, radio and satellite tracking and we could only rely on rings and those of you that know the statistics for birds like lesser kestrel since 1948 only seven rings have been found i ringed 500 birds and got one ring back so my stats were fairly good on that but um, I was looking at all different parameters here. I'm taking blood samples for genetic analysis, but also for hemoparasites, because I, I thought that um, there would be discrete differences in the broad spread across the Palearctic region. And I was right that the Eastern and Western population do seem to have different um, parasite loads and different compositions. And also genetically, we could separate simply from blood samples whether the birds were from the East or the West. I then set off for Kazakhstan. Um, and this is a historic picture. I'm here with Anatoly Dabigora from the uh, University of Orenburg in the Southern Urals. We just drove in with our visas. We just, the, the border between Russia and Kazakhstan was a broken fence, which we drove over. And here we, um, I'm taking a blood sample from an imperial eagle. And on the strength of the sample, the Eastern and Western populations were separated. So it's, it's an enormous fun I had. In the history of ornithology, um, I think never had so much vodka been consumed. Um, I was still drinking. I, I'm a reformed drinker. But um, I, I, I could never get over the, the, these people's extreme ability to down swimming pools full of vodka. It taught me quite a lot of how not to conduct oneself. But after 15 years of studying and after getting my master's um, at the University of Cambridge, I was able to compress 15 years of research into one entry in the red data book for birds. And, and I, I, I thought, and I still do think it fairly elegant that I could actually, after 15 years of running around the world, come to a point where my life work was summarized in one and a half pages. After returning from Cambridge, of course, you know, the, the scales of justice found that I was um, heavy enough. I had enough gravitas to become a lecturer. And I fondly remember my lecturing years at the university of one of the, one of the high points of my life i've always been passionate about teaching and if there's one thing that i can say with complete honesty is that um i don't want a legacy i don't want to be remembered there's no need for it because everything i know lives in my students that i've had the, the, the great honor to teach, not all of them, some were complete fools um, and remain so to this day, but <laughs> a number of them um, have become, in my view, important people in the, in, in the world of conservation. And of that, I am enormously proud. Through a friend of mine, Rob Martin, um, certainly one of the greatest scientific influences of my life, 
Um, we then started publishing very widely on a great number of subjects, um, specifically on, we did the first intensive survey of peregrine density in the southwestern Cape and pushed the numbers up much higher than previously thought. Um, uh, 20 years of research went into hobby falcon hunting behavior, less orchestral work, and finally, before Rob died, we published his magnum opus on the um, breeding populations of booted eagles in the Cape province. Again, we uh, pushed the numbers up way beyond what was thought possible. In between teaching and research, I also... Um, have you asked me to start a video? Uh, a little picture, sorry, a little picture. Okay. Um, I moved into consultation with a friend of mine called Bertie van Hensbergen, to whom I owe quite a lot. And um, we spent many decades in Africa doing sustainable resource management. And I think one of the most fascinating things we did in the Kilimbero Valley of Tanzania was to, um, to enrich enrichment planting of Miombo that had been destroyed by overutilization. Um, it was a complex uh, project, but we showed that structurally one could actually rehabilitate a, a, a vegetation type at the landscape level, not only at the local level, by wide-ranging enrichment planting um, with the help of the local communities. Little lesson number one, we had enormous problem with, with the workers who were all illiterate, of course, and had to follow extremely complex planting regimes um, that were gener computer generated, randomized. So, you know, we, we couldn't rely on them to read the, 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 the pro forma plans. And it was a hell of a battle until one day I decided to join the gang and actually physically begin working with them. Hard, hard, hard days. The downside of this is this orange bucket um, at the bottom right hand corner of the slide. Now, God knows what it contained at night, but in daytime it had beans in it. Um, and then of course I had to join the, uh, the crew eating from a communal bone, a bowl. And um, the one thing that, that strikes me about the African cooks is that there must be an advanced school of cooking in some crater somewhere that teaches them how to, to cook a blowfly, that it's still al dente with its wings attached, um, all its legs on nice and crunchy. Uh, that is just by the way. With, um, with Professor Ida Grundy, a social forester, I then moved into social forestry and started working in Buindi. Many of you will know the spectacular uh, rainforest in Uganda, where um, half the world's mountain gorillas still hang out on an island now, they're completely cut off. Um, but it was fascinating times working with the, with the pygmy communities that had at that stage been evicted from the forest when it was declared a World Heritage Site. Um, and I, I, I still marvel at the times we spent um, gaining their confidence. I was invited on, on, on antelope hunts with Basenjis. These are the um, African barkless dogs. And with a bit of imagination, you can see that they have little bells around their neck because they can't bark, um, filled with grass. And the moment a diker, you know, yellow diker, zebra diker is flushed, then of course you follow the bell. So I was, I was privileged to be witness to one of the, the last of these people still hunting in the old traditional ways. Um, someone talked about Nyasa. Um, I worked in Lechenga for a long time um, in the spectacular, this is north east of Lechenga um, in, the, in the Miombo um, woodlands. Um, trying to, to figure out how to manage it sustainably and just make a, a mental note of these fires burning. We were told there was nobody, but once we started flying over it, there was landscape burning um, for two purposes. The one, the clearing for making 
uh, patches for agriculture. And this blue smoke here from the little evergreen patch is the curing of bush meat. For, for many years, I worked in the Kilombero Valley of Tanzania um, in for a teak company, but I was um, part of the, the biodiversity and conservation team. And uh, as you will only know too well, the, uh, the enormous problems of, um, of illegal tree cutting. Uh, you know, this is where Dalbergia melanoxylon um, occurs. It's a spectacularly expensive wood at about, at that stage, it was costing 29,000 29, US per cubic meter, making it the most expensive wood in the world. And these poor people were cutting Dalbergia, selling planks for five rand, which on the open market would fetch $5,000. Um, so it was always in the back of my mind, you know, how do you deal with this kind of problem if you know that it's driven by abject poverty? Um, and we have many examples of, of down in our country with uh, the um, illegal hunting of rhino and all kinds of endangered species. The people on the ground are not the people causing the problem. It's the end user, as we know. Talking about stupid, I mean, have you ever seen anything so profoundly ridiculous of holding a gaboon adder with one hand and staring through a bloody camera with the other? Um, I, I, if I think back of the, of, of, of the profound stupidities I did, and you know, but anyway, I love snakes and um, had a great time playing with these marvelous creatures. Then this is where Yako comes in. Yaku um, came to me and said, shall we start a, um, a TV program? And I said, surely you must be jesting, you must be completely mad. No, he said, we made a little clip somewhere in the river and strangely enough, people took it up. This, of course, forced me into corners I'd never been. Diving, for instance. I was put in a suit, a tank was put on my back, lots of weights around my middle, and said, if you want to go down, pull this lever. So inevitably, I shot to the bottom, sat at the bottom of wherever we were filming, uh, made a few gestures, and then they said, if you want to go up, pull the other lever. But the making of, of the, the series of Hrun enriched my life fabulously. Um, we, we moved all over the subcontinent. Of the high points, I was in the Khalikhadi, where I had the incredible honor to spend days in the felt with Willem Kraper, one of the, one of the legends of tracking. Um, the, to me, I could have spent a year with him. Um, and for that, Jaco, I'm deeply grateful for these wonderful opportunities. And perhaps at some stage before I, uh, as my friend used to say, jump the twig, we can do something again. Oh yeah, we went to tropical islands, coconut crabs. Um, never in my life had I been so in my element. It was hugely enjoying. And just by the way, one of my best enemies came to me one day and said, he's finally figured out why Hrun works so well. And I said, please pray tell. He said, it works so well because deep down it's so shallow because nothing ever happened really, except me kicking stones and picking up crabs. The next port of call was the Notophagus rainforests of Chile on the edge of Patagonia, where with Bertie we formed a team working with the Mapuche Indians, um, doing quite a number of things. The first one was to, to adapt our, our wonderful SAS system, the water uh, system, South African standard system to the Chilean conditions, which worked extremely well. So this has become the Chilean national standard for biodiversity in, uh, indices in rivers. Um, and, um, and we worked in, in breathtaking country. This is Pukun, a um, uh, wonderful active volcano outside of your Taken from your hotel room at night, you can see the lava flowing through the snow. But I have to stop at this slide. Of the greatest influences of my life, 
was meeting the Mapuche Indians of, of South, deep South America. Now these were the naked savages that Darwin found um, on his voyage with the Beagle. Um, but never in my life, and one can just see it absolutely radiating from this picture, have I seen such peaceful people living in utter, utter harmony with their environment, where they hold a cosmology that is extremely simple, of the entire universe consisting of the moon, the sun, the stars, and the wind. Um, and so they are deeply, deeply connected to their environment and have been treated extremely badly by the Chilean um, government. And I became a sort of a radical social forester and saying, burn the lorries. I, I think I made a mistake there. But in any case, I sort of tried to mobilize them into saying no, no, no. What came of my involvement in South America was certainly something I'm deeply proud of. I was the chief author of the <clears throat> environmental guidelines for sustainable forestry in Chile, a landmark publication. It was part of a series. There were other social documents as well, but we worked extremely hard in <clears throat> getting these wonderful, they are actually wonderful guidelines together and um, it's uh, one of the great achievements of my life. I know, because you're not supposed to be close to a gorilla, but what happened, I was leading a group of people uh, for Live the Journey, which is the next phase of my life when I started tour guiding as a specialist guide, never with more than 12 people, taking them obviously to see gorillas, Borneo, Iceland, God knows, all over the show. Um, and in this picture, you can see me. But what I'm actually doing is bracing my stomach muscles because I knew what was going to happen. The next minute, he whacked me um, to the side. He was on his way to a delectable female, and I was in the way. <clears throat> and not aggressively, as you know, simply getting me out of the way, he slapped me, and I flew out of the picture to the right. Of the most interesting and possibly the most dangerous work I ever did was flying from Entebbe uh, in a private caravan aircraft straight into Sudan, over, over the Congo, into southern Sudan, um, where we, our company was involved in trying to set up a sustainable chain of supply of teak that the British had planted there in 1953. We made this airstrip, etc., built a camp, built a school, built a hospital. And after four years, some of you may know, the Lord's Resistance Army came in and burnt everything to the ground. But, and here I will, here, wonderful area. I mean, those of you that have been in Equatoria will know of its, its deep charms. Um, oh, just a little. This is Bertie on the right looking one. We're sitting in, a, in, in what's known as a restaurant eating beans with flies in it. Um, but Bertie was feeling poorly at the time. And to this man, I owe all my scientific knowledge of conservation. I'm a naturalist. I sort of, you know, kick stones and pick up things. But Bertie van Hensbergen has been a profound in influence in my life. And to him, I owe a huge debt of gratitude. But I now want to start preaching to you. One of my jobs in Equatoria was <clears throat> to take the village elders. Now you can, you can see that they, most of them are over 50. Oh Lord, I was still young then. Um, and all of them speak English because of the, uh, the colonial times that the British were still there. And as part of my brief, I was asked to introduce the, the leaders of the community into the principles of conservation biology. What I did, you can see I, I brought a lot of things, little blocks of wood, which is trophic levels, and I made a gigantic mistake by blowing up an inflatable globe. Um, you know, for perspective, so puff, 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 I built up the ground and said, we are here, and pointed it at the middle of Africa. And they all said, ah. And, and then a hand went up and said, what is that blue stuff? 
that was the ocean. And so for the rest of the day, I stood with this bloody ball in the air. Um, so a bit of a mistake, but I lost heart because uh, the course was supposed to be a week. And by Thursday morning, I said to Bertie, I might as well be talking to the stone statues on a Pacific island. You know, nothing is going into their heads, their eyes are stone dead. By Thursday afternoon, as if by magic, as if by sheer magic, the light came on, their eyes lit up. Suffice it to say that the next time I came, you know, we, we didn't only have classes, we went into the, into the rainforest, and here I'm explaining a strangler fig, for instance. But every, on every subsequent visit, these gentlemen would run to the aircraft and say, not hello, you old bastard. They would say, we know. Now we know. And never in my life have I done any work so deeply gratifying as seeing people of the earth from a specific place suddenly understanding the hidden links of why they are there, what happens if they start cutting these threads. Um, it was a profound inference on my life. This brings me to finger wagging and possibly a suggestion. I find it inconceivable to do any work in sustainable resource management if before you start a gender study and a social study is not conducted. And I'm talking here about a structured study because if we start scratching under the surface, this kind of encoding of our of daily life and habits directly impacts on our social, cultural and economic status in society. So now we know who we're dealing with. We know if you look at gender studies in, in Zara, we know about fear. We know about female genital mutilation, what it does to people. Um, we know about hopes and expectations. And the same holds true for a social impact study because public involvement and social impact assessment works together. Um, one leading to effective public consultation on a proposed action and the other providing evidence as to how the proposed action will change the lives of individuals and the, inf the affected community. It's so easy for us to constantly talk about the community will, for instance, benefit from whatever we do. Who are we talking about? And, and how do they think? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their expectations? And without a structured social and gender study, it is completely impossible to pulse the expectations and needs of a society or a group of people that is impacted by our conservation action. I cannot stress this enough, I cannot stress it enough, that I refuse to do any form of sustainable, utilize, uh, sustainable utilization of, of natural resources without insisting that a gender study be conducted, which we can do in our company, and also doing a social impact study. It is utterly, utterly, please, please remember this. Okay, now I've wagged fingers and I'm, I'm going to become even more nasty. Last year, uh, the IUCN published this frightening report. Um, just a summary of what has gone wrong. You know, we have the state of the, the planet by, by WWF, but the, this IUCN report is doubly important and it shows us um, in, in very easily digestible diagrams, just in what dire straits the earth is. Um, for, you know, if you think of biomass and species abundance across the globe, um, it has fallen by the order of 80%. I mean, you can later on read all these little blips, but it's a dire, dire picture. All known groups of animals that we know, crustacea, coral reefs, conifers, gastropods, birds and bony fishes, fishes are all on a spiral. 
downwards. We know this. We know this and we bear silent witness to what is happening to the world around us. We can see from the graph on the left that the trouble started at the turn of the last century, but within that, within that um, century, there are two other most important happenings. The first was in 1910, when Churchill converted the British fleet from coal to oil. And today we have Syria, today we have Yemen, today we have the horror of Palestine. All of this impacted by this great move of the West into the, into the East, or the Middle East at least, and Gertrude Bell, the great Arabist, uh, she was an extraordinary woman who rode a camel from Beirut to Baghdad. After she got to Baghdad, she went to Cairo and told Churchill, and she said, Prime Minister, or, or he was First Lord of the Admiralty, I suspect, and she said, you have no idea who you are dealing with with the Arabs. They are not entities. The entire Arabia consists of bloodlines. And how, how terrifyingly right she was. The other terrifying occurrence of that century was on July the 16th, 1945, when at Alamo Gordo, the first atom bomb was detonated. And Robert Oppenheimer, the chief designer, um, was, he was a mystic, he was a deeply spiritual man, stood in the bunker as the flash went off and quoted from the Bhagavad Gita and said, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And how effective we have been in that. Look closely at this map. This image is Europe and Africa seen in two wavelengths. The, the, the white spots are the visible light spectrum, and there you can see Stellenbosch, a little spot, and, and Chris, you up there, and, and little spots, a bit of oil fires um, in Nigeria. But effectively, this is still a dark continent compared to Europe. But then, in the infrared band, you see this extraordinary swathe of fires, the entire Madagascar, the whole of Miombo, um, the Sahel, burning annually. I maintain that the biodiversity of Africa in the next perhaps 30 years will completely collapse. I'm not talking about the rainforests and the, and the, um, and the drier areas, but Miombo and the savannas will collapse because of 150 to 200 years of annual burning. These systems never developed to do, they, they should burn at three or five years. So on top of the atmospheric problems we have, we also have behavioral problems mainly driven by poverty. It is now time for me to be uh, your lecture. What is conservation? Listen carefully, I think I'm right. Conservation is not a science, but it is a multidisciplinary management system. It contains sociology, medicine, history. It's a vast collection of um, disciplines rolled into a management system. But after that, there's a colon, which is, but above all, it is about people. Equally important, secondly, what is science? Science is very difficult, uh, very easy to define. Science is simply systematized knowledge, comma, which is self-regulating. So it means that should science is taken out, unlike dogma, where you can't take Leviticus out of the Bible or some parts out of the Quran. We have to remember that it's self-regulating and never more eloquently illustrated by none other than Jakob Brunowski, who said science is a very human form of knowledge. We're always at the brink of the known. We always feel forward of what is to be hoped. Hope is the key here. And every judgment in science stands on the edge of error and is personal. But then to me, the great, wonderful, heartwarming statement, science 
is a tribute to what we can know, although we are fallible, we fail every day. And in the same interview, this is from his um, series, The Ascent of Man, I think it's uh, chapter 11 called Knowledge and Certainty, where he says, in the end, the words were said by Oliver Cromwell, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible that you may be mistaken. It is extremely difficult for a scientist to come to the point to say that my life work is actually worthless because I was wrong all along. We have to constantly question what we do is right. Taking that one step back to a personal level, there is a code of conduct, I believe, in science and the way we do science and the way we do conservation. The first is that we should treat ourselves like someone that you're taking care of because if your world is not well the world is not well this means that unlike when where i come from robertson people thought that if they had food on the table and swept the yard the family would be happy that's bullshit and um, you have to be inherently whole and well before you can actually give and give fully it is our duty to denounce and debunk pseudoscience, fake news, God knows we've got enough of it. Uh, the most appalling, I mean, it, around COVID, there is this, this absolute tsunami of crap um, about, you know, uh, G5 and all kinds of rubbish. We have to stand up and denounce it boldly. Fourthly, we have to understand the nature of sacrifice. To make a sacrifice is not to lose but to make sacred. Remember that the sacrifice is not loss, it's making sacred. And in that, it's actually quite good for you. And most of our scientists, and especially the speakers, have been very eloquent in, in bringing out this spirit of the place. There are certain places that we live and work that hold, that we hold dear, those wonderful camps in the Congo. They have spirit of place. And we have to find it before we can hold. And in, 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 on a personal level, lastly, we have to understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Now, um, I'm, I'm coming to the, the, the bold insults to you lot now, but um, there is a distinct place for older scientists because they have deep knowledge. They don't have the current uh, whiz bang zoom mechanics of doing science. They can't do ANOVAs, you know, they used to work with hand cranked little calculators, but they do have knowledge and we should actually make sure that in our decision making process, we have older scientists that can, that can guide us. On a communal level, and I am, forgive me for this, I'm just looking generally at our group, we are too white. We need Africans. We need, and I, I, I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but they, there must be a pathway to get more young people from Africa um, and dilute the sea of white. Um, we are too old. I mean, you know, I'm perfectly useless. I, I'm still a bit um, fairly fit, but I, you know, I can't do the work that I did when I was 40. Um, we must, and Chris, I'm glad that you have now uh, once a month bringing in young people. It's terrifyingly important to bring young people into science because science isn't cool to millennial, millennials anymore. They want to, you know, have pop-up shops and tat tattoo parlors. Something I said recently in a program that I made for, for Yako's program, Quella, is that we our brushwork, uh, figuratively speaking, in terms of conservation, is much too fine. And I use the example of the ghost frog on table now. It's a miserable frog. God knows it's a horrible little thing. Um, it lives in two or three streams. All over the world, there are now pairs of ghost frogs being being um, raised in, in a desperate attempt. I say, look after the mountain and the frogs will be fine. Now that's, you know, 
That's a, a dangerous thing to say, but I do mean it, that we have to look at the landscape level more and more than trying to pinpoint little and putting out tiny fires. Um, and lastly, a, a classic problem we've had it all along is that we need to develop a new conservation lexicon. We need to have ambassadors, hopefully young and bright, that can speak to politicians. Um, generally speaking, if you were to put a, a, a penguin in the salad of the Minister of the Environment, he or she wouldn't know what the hell it was. Um, we need desperately to have a lingua franca that politicians can understand. I mean this very earnestly. And there must be a way of developing this new lexicon. We have to be in to ensure of a, a, a sense of morality when we consult and when we work in nature to do no harm. I know it sounds like patient strong, but honestly, I mean, these are very, very earnest points. Do no harm, be honest, be fair. Be aware of your own limitations. Nothing irritate me more than, than general scientists, you know, saying, oh, well, I can do the frog work. You can't, sir, you can't. Get Alan Channing to do it, uh, or somebody that knows something about uh, frogs. Um, we, we tend to glib over it too quickly. There is a, a, a great need for ethics, and, and not only in consulting, but also in environmental matters. Um, it's rarely mentioned, but I do think it's time that we start discussing this. I have a cross to bear that it so happened to, mainly due to Yaku and his program, that out of the 24,000 practicing scientists in this country, I made the, the top 20 of being visible. Now, I'm sure you can't see this, but you know, in amongst the top 20 is a person by the name of Professor Tim Noakes. Um, so if that's what it is being famous, I'm not sure whether I should be too proud of this lot here, but it, it's a huge burden because I have a sense of responsibility to whenever I interact with the public, to be first of all, brutally honest and fair, and also to be ethical about it. Um, it's just one of those crosses I have to bear. Now, Chris, I see the time's nearly up. Recently, I had a, a great health scare and I landed in ICU. Um, and in order to, to dilute the, the sheer fright of possibly dying, I put my computer in between the pipes on my stomach and wrote this article in, in a scientific book, which has just been published. And please don't laugh at me. My, the, the prescription I had was to write about the morality of ecology. And I've, I said it's a it contradiction in terminus. It cannot be because in order to be moral, you have to be a person. Conservation and ecology can be ethical, but not moral. And I stuck my neck out and with the help of Professor Andreas Van Dijk, who's one of the finest legal minds I know, got to a point where I said that in order for us in future to deal with environmental degradation, we have to give landscapes, biomes and places human rights. We have to make the Congo a legal person. And lo and behold, I'm extremely happy to say in the five or six months since the publication of this, there are two examples, one in Bolivia and one in Canada, where in both cases, a river by national decree law was given the status of humans. And we find it more and more in primate research. So we have to start thinking about really giving the living landscape the same rights as human beings. How do, how do we do this? Most of you know about the, um, the species area um, equations worked out by 
by um, by Wilson um, with his fabulous work on the islands off the coast of America. We know that if a little island were to arise from the ocean like it does in Iceland, after three years there'll be a dandelion and then perhaps a little crab and so on. So islands form. It is our duty as scientists, as conservation workers and as human beings to be moral and make, make it known. Form your own little island. Say that in the sea of uncertainty and instability, I am not secure because remember Oliver Cromwell, I make mistakes, but I'm trying to live a moral life. I talk to my neighbor, to my friends, and if we have enough little islands of stability, continents of stability will form. It is our duty, it is our life duty to speak to our neighbors, our our brethren, our brothers and sisters, and, and, and make sure that we pass on this message that there are other ways of living. And if enough of us do it, and enough of us create little centers of stability, we will form little continents of stability. There was a, a Mexican conservationist called Carlos Castaneros, a man I particularly admire. The problem with him was that he spent most of his life eating mushrooms. He was a shroom head, so he wasn't very productive. But one of his lasting legacies, and I know this is again patient strong, who said, and he said this over and over, he said, if you choose a path in life, choose a path with a heart. In other words, a living heart in your path. And in my last couple of years, I've discovered through travels um, India, and I've been, I've been deeply humbled by the India. Of course, they're Gupta, so they'll steal your money. Um, but speaking generally, this whole idea of Dharma, of, of the right path. And if you fail, perhaps your children will not fail. Or if you're reincarnated for the billionth time, next time it will be uh, it will be better. So my, my message to you is one of ethics, one of morality, and above all, if you choose any path in conservation, make it a path with a living heart. I thank you. <laughs>